everybody. Welcome back. It's week two. What we want to look at today is how do we use the web to capture data from our users and then how are we going to uh, save and store that data permanently. So you've already completed exercise one. So we should take a look at the process of how this is all going to work. Okay. I like to think about the process of getting data from our users. It's kind of like going to the grocery store, if you think about it. We, in both both scenarios, um, we want to get something, so we want to collect things. So on the web, we want to collect information from our users. Uh, in the grocery store, what we want to collect is presumably food. Um, and in both cases, we need some kind of container that can hold all the things we want. So in the grocery store, we might use a basket or a shopping cart. Um, and the mechanism we have on the web to collect information is an HTML form. So that's our container that holds all of our inputs. Now, uh, much like in the grocery store, how your shopping cart is, it's really not very smart. I mean, it can hold our inputs, it can hold our food, but it can't tell us how much our bill is gonna be and it can't process our payment. Well, our HTML form is kind of like our grocery cart. Um, it's not very smart. All it can really do is collect the data, but it can't do any processing. So what do we need to do? Well, in the grocery store, when we want to action before we can actually leave, we need to take our cart to the checkout, uh, the checkout line. We need to get all of our items totaled, and then we have to process a valid payment before we're allowed to go on our way with our groceries. So really, it's similar with uh, form inputs on the web. We use our HTML form to collect them, but then we need to save those inputs off to our server and do some coding, do some processing on the server in order that we can store that information permanently. So that's the process, what we're going to be doing this week. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So the first part is how we're actually going to get information from our users. So HTML is really... Um, it's not a very smart language. It doesn't have a lot of logic involved, but one thing it can do is it can we can present an interface, we can design a web page that will allow users to give us the information that we want. Now, what that uh, in the form of an HTML form. Now, what that form looks like really depends what the purpose of our web page is. What are we asking users to do? Do we want to give them a registration page and allow them to sign up? for our website. Um, maybe we've built an e-commerce site and we want to allow the user to post a review on a product they bought. Um, maybe they're doing posting on a blog or social media or it could be anything else. So what our form is gonna look like and how it's gonna work really is depending on what it is we're asking for the users. But in any case, when we want information from our users, we're gonna use this HTML form as a container. So let's talk a little bit more about our HTML forms and we'll go ahead and code one shortly. So what do we need? We need this HTML form tag you see here. And when we create a form tag, we're gonna have to have an, a closing form tag. Now it's important that all of the inputs, everything that needs to live inside of our form has to go in between, in here, in between our opening and closing tag in order for it to be processed. There are a couple other things we want to specify, specify about our form. There's a lot of different attributes we can add inside of our opening form tag. There's two that we're going to need each time. The first thing we're going to need is to declare a method. There's different ways forms can be submitted to the web server for processing. The two main methods are what's known as get and what's known as post. Um, the strange thing is that if we don't actually specify, you can see highlighted here, I've got the method equals post attribute. If we don't actually specify a method, get is actually the default method. That's sort of an old legacy feature of HTML forms that's never really been updated. Probably 99% of the time we actually wanna use post instead of get. So we need to make sure we add this attribute so our form doesn't use the default method of get. And we'll look at the difference between post and get a little bit later. For now, suffice it to say, post is simply more secure than get. So most of the time we're gonna use post. So that's one attribute we're gonna to wanna to include in our form. The other attribute we're gonna to wanna to include is what's called the action. Now the action tells the web server when the user is done and submits their inputs to the server, what's the name of the page that's going to catch or receive and then process these inputs. So in this example here, I've just used page two 
and you'll notice we have a .php extension on page two. Now, technically, it's possible for a form, if we leave this attribute out, the form is just going to post or submit to itself. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. You may see code examples that do that. Personally, I prefer to break this into two steps. We have one, our first page that presents our user with our form. Then we have our second page that processes all of the form inputs. I find it's cleaner to do this process over two pages. You'll also notice the file extension on my second page is .php. The reason that that file needs to have a PHP extension is, again, we, HTML is not smart, so we can use HTML to collect the inputs, but we can't use HTML to actually interpret and process those inputs. We're gonna need a server-side scripting language like PHP, and as we talked about last week, any page that's gonna run PHP scripts and PHP, PHP code has to have a .php extension. So we're gonna need, just like you see in the example on the left, we're gonna need input fields, one field for all of the different inputs that we want from our users, and then down at the bottom, what we typically expect to see is a submit button. So when the user clicks this button, it automatically triggers the submission of our form, the data gets sent to the server, and it will load whatever page we've specified in our action attribute. You'll also notice for good formatting, that I've enclosed the attribute values of post and page 2.php in double quotes. This is standard HTML convention and we'll want to use this for proper formatting. Now, how do we build these forms? Well, really there's a suite of HTML controls available to us and what controls we use really depends on what information we're asking for from our users. So the most common type of input is a single line text box. You can see those in the example here. So we might use text boxes for simple text or string values like first name and last name, numeric values, for example, we have here salary. Some of our other common controls would be things like a drop down list where we're going to present the user with a list of choices and allow them to pick one. This is known as an HTML select tag. We also have radio buttons, as you can see here in the department. Again, radio buttons where, are where we want to present the user with a list of choices and we want them to pick one and only one. Functionally, the list, the select box and the radio buttons are the same. We've given the user a choice and they only pick one. So how do we decide which one to use? Um, Fair question. Typically, if we have a lot of choices, we're going to want to use a drop down list because to display every choice with the radio button is simply going to take up too much space on our screen. If we only have a few choices and the text of those choices isn't very long, radio buttons are more user friendly because it means the user doesn't have to click the item in order to see all the choices. We also have options like check boxes for things like yes, no, or true, false fields, or a list of check boxes where we want to give a user a list of choices and allow them to pick as many of those options as they like. We've got our submit button down at the right that will trigger the submission of our form inputs to the server. And we also have a reset button that will automatically clear out our form. So it takes a little bit of practice to start building forms where we're matching user requirements and we can understand which form controls to use. But uh, really it's pretty simple and once we do it a few times, you're gonna get comfortable with it quite quickly. So the next thing we're gonna do, once we've built and saved our first page, then we need to build a second page that has that PHP extension where we can read or parse or interpret each of our values. Eventually, what we're gonna to wanna to do is connect that page up to our database and save each value so we have that information accessible to us at any time in the future. But we'll get to that. Typically, the way that we read the values is using a built-in object in the PHP library that's called the post collection or array. And you'll notice it has this syntax, dollar sign underscore post. So an array is basically a list of related values. So if we built an input form that had four different text boxes on it, each one of those would be a new item in our post collection or array. So we can see from the example, if we put in a text box on our form called first underscore name, we could refer to the value that the user entered with this syntax, dollar sign underscore post, square brackets, single quotes, and then the name of our form input. Now it's important to note in PHP, these names are case sensitive. 
So if we on our form, we called our first name with a capital F, and we tried to refer to our input with a lowercase f, we're going to get a blank value. PHP won't recognize that those things are the same. So one of the things I'm going to recommend we do, and in all the code samples I do, I'm going to name, make sure I name everything all in lowercase. And where I have multiple words, I'll usually separate those with underscores. This way, I'm not going to get confused between upper and lowercase. We'll do a code sample in a minute, and I'll show you exactly how this works. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up a code editor, and we're going to create our first form. Um, if you're looking for code editors, you can find them in Blackboard. Um, I suggested in week one where you could find a code editor. So under activity four, there are a number of code editors. All of these are free downloads. You can use any file that you like. Um, for today, I'm going to use, I think I'm going to use Microsoft Expression Web. It's an editor I'm pretty comfortable with. So I'm going to open that up. We'll make our font a little bigger. So it's a little easier to see. Now I'm going to make a new PHP file. Actually, before I do, I'm going to set a couple of the options in here just so that I get an HTML5 template. I click on Tools and Applic... Sorry, wrong menu. Tools and Page Editor Options. And if I click on the Authoring tab, I'm going to make sure that my document type is set to HTML5 and my CSS schema is set to CSS3. This program is a few years old, so those aren't set as the default, but that'll give me, every time I create a new page, the HTML template that I want. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on my little drop down here and click New PHP Page. And I'm just going to add in a title of First HTML Form. So what we're going to need here are several things. We're going to need an HTML form. We're going to put a, an input on the form, and then we're going to need a way to trigger a form submission. One of the other reasons I like Expression Web, you'll notice as I, start, as I type, when I type an F inside of an opening HTML tag, Expression Web recognizes and prompts me with all of the possible HTML tags that start with F. So I'm going to put in a form tag. And in here, we want to set two attributes that we mentioned earlier. We want to set the method. And by default on Expression Web, if I just type M and click equals, it jump automatically completes the word for me, finishes the equal sign, and then gives me my double quotes and prompts me with my options. So what we want to specify is our method as post. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's our most common method. Later on, I'll toggle it to get, and you'll see the reason why we prefer post. The other thing we want to add is an action. So what's the name of the page that's going to process these form inputs? So I'm going to call my page show-email.php. And then when I close the tag, Expression Web automatically generates the closing tag for me. Now, I'm going to hit the Enter key several times to move my closing form tag down because all of the form inputs need to go in this space. You'll notice on lines 12 and 13, in between my opening and closing form tag. Now, I usually like to save my work as I go. So I'm going to click Save. Where am I going to save it? I've created, I have a teaching folder. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to I have an online folder for our class. I'm going to make a Comp1006 folder. Notice my folder name is all lowercase, and there are no spaces in it. And there's a reason for this. The reason is, Later, we're going to, when we upload this directory to the web server, um, we're going to use this same path in order to test out our page. And for web paths, it's a good idea that A, we don't have spaces in the names, and B, also you need to keep in mind our web server is case sensitive. So the easiest way not to get confused is just to name all of our web pages and all of our directories in all lowercase. So I'm going to create my Comp1006 directory. Then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make a new folder and I'm going to call this week one. Sorry, I guess we're in week two. 
And in here, I'm going to call this email-form.php. Now there's no actual PHP code on here. If I wanted to give it a .htm or .html extension, that would be fine. In general, later on, if we wanted to add other PHP code, however, we would need that .php extension. So I'm just going to give it a .php extension right from the beginning. So we'll start to build this. All we want to do is basically we're going to put on a single line text box where we can ask a user to enter their email address and then we'll give them a button to submit that data to the server. So how do we generate a single line text box? If I open a tag, what we want is an HTML input tag. Okay. Now for every input, we need to give each one a unique name. So whenever we create an input, doesn't matter whether it's a text box, drop down this radio button, we want to specify the name attribute. And then attribute should be descriptive. It should describe what kind of value we're asking the user for. So I don't want four controls on here called text one, text two, text three, text four, because it really doesn't describe accurately what each value is. So I'm gonna call this email and I'm, gonna, I'm in the habit of using all lowercase to help account for the case sensitivity on the server. Now there is another attribute I could add if I like here. I could add type equals text. Now this is the default. So if this will generate, if I don't specify any type attribute at all, HTML will automatically render a single line text box, which is what I want. So I can include this type equals text attribute if I want to. I don't really need it. It just really adds extra HTML to my page, which slows down the download time. So I'm actually going to remove that for the moment. And then I'll just make that tag self-closing. If we jump into Notice I'm in the code window here. When you, If you're using Expression Web and you've opened it up, you might be in the design window. We don't want to type our code here. We want to type it in the code window. But if I jump to the design, we can now see there that HTML tag generates a single line text box on my form. That's good. The other thing we should probably do is give the user a label or some information beside the text box that explains what they're supposed to enter. So beside, Actually, I'll put it above. It'll still appear beside because HTML doesn't recognize line breaks unless we explicitly put them in. I'm going to put in an HTML label tag. And I'll say that our label is for our input called email. And we'll put on a message here that says enter your email. I'll save my change again. And now if we jump back to design view, we can see our label appears. So this is good. It looks good so far. We've got instructions, we've got a text box, but you'll notice there's no way for the user to actually, they can enter their email, but they can't actually send it to the server. So what we're also going to need on here is another type of input button. Now there's a couple ways we can do this. I think I'm going to use this. I'm going to use the button tag. We'll need to specify that our type is a submit button. Okay. Notice you'll see button reset and submit. Reset will clear out your form. By default, if we have a button type equals button, the button actually doesn't do anything. That's where we want to write custom code, for example, to redirect the user from one page to another. But when we want to submit a form, what we need is a type equals submit. And then inside my opening and closing tag, I can put in the text submit. I'll save my change. Now our form will look like this. So what we want to do now is we want to get connected to our account on the DreamHost web server. We want to upload this file to the server and we want to try it out. Um, if you can't remember your instructions, if you haven't set up your connection from last week, you'll find instructions on how to connect to the DreamHost web server in uh, the weekly learning week one folder. So if you need to pause the video now and get connected to the server, that's fine. I'm going to walk through the process again. So the program we want to use for this, you're going to get comfortable with this. We'll be using it every week is FileZilla. So I've got it right here pinned to my start menu. So I'm going to click on FileZilla. And then if you followed the instructions for last week, you should already have your dream host connection saved. So I'm going to go to my dream host connection.
And when I connect, I get to this screen to get into my public directory. I just click on my GCR Freeman.Computer Studies. That's my public directory. Yours will be the same, except you'll have your nine digit student number instead of R Freeman. So if you click on that, if you don't already have a directory from last week, and you should, I'm gonna recreate my Comp 1006. If I just right click and choose Create Directory, I'm gonna create a Comp 1006 directory for our class. And then I'm gonna go inside of it. I'm gonna create a week two directory and enter it. Now what I wanna do is browse my local machine to my Comp 1006 week two. And here's our email form PHP page we just created. So I've got about, there's three different ways I can copy it to the server. I can double click it. I could drag and drop, or I could right click and choose upload. Any of these will copy my local file to the server. So I'm gonna upload, we can now see a copy, and now we can go to our browser and look at our page. So in my browser, if I go to gcrfreeman.computerstudies, again, your URL will be the same, except instead of rfreeman, it'll be your student number. Then I'm gonna enter my Comp 1006 directory. I'm gonna enter my week two directory, and I'll load email form .php. And now there's our form. So no PHP code, HTML only. So if you don't have your server, your page up and loading on the server, you may wanna pause and rewatch the video uh, and rewind a little bit, check your form and make sure it's loaded on the server. Now I'm gonna do one other thing. I'm not crazy about the formatting of this. I don't really, in most forms, we've got the submit button down below. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of HTML. All I need to do is if I add a field set tag, and I'm just gonna move my closing field set down below my text box, and then I will indent. So now my label and text box should appear on one line inside of a field set, and my button should appear down below. So if we wanna update the file that's on the server, I can save that change. Come back, there's no need to refresh. As long as my change is saved, I can just re-upload my form. Now this message starts to get annoying after a while. If I don't wanna get prompted that I, I know I'm overwriting my file. If I say always use this action, I won't get prompted for this message every time I upload, which I find saves me time. So now if I refresh, you'll notice that field set tag, it wraps the label and text box into a single line. It puts the submit button below and it actually draws a border around it as well. So what happens now? Let's see, I can enter in a test email. I don't have to put in my real one. And when I click submit, we get a 404 not found error. Now, why did we get this? This is actually the result that we want. The reason we got this is notice, we're trying to load showemail.php. Well, and that should be inside of our Comp 1006 Week 2 folder. If we go to the server and look in Comp 1006 Week 2, we get a 404 not found because we haven't built show email yet. That'll be the page that we'll build next. And I wanna come back to one other point about our form. I've, I've mentioned a few times the issue of method equals post and how it's important that we specify this in our form. I'm gonna show you what happens if I don't specify method equals post. You don't have to change your form. I'm just gonna show you for demonstration. So I'm gonna save my file without method equals post. I'll re-upload my change to the server. Go back to my form and refresh. Now my form looks identical, but watch what happens now when I submit. Look carefully at the URL. We still got a 404 not found because we haven't built our show email page, but what do you notice at the end of the URL? We now see the value that I typed in to the text box. Now my email address isn't a sensitive piece of information, but imagine for a moment that my form was a login form where we were giving the user inputs for username and password. If we don't specify that our method is post, our method defaults to get, and what happens with get? The form inputs are included in the URL, which is highly, highly insecure. So we always wanna make sure 
that we specify our method is post so that our form inputs don't show up as the part of the URL. When I return my method to post, we'll notice you'll notice those form inputs don't show up in the URL anymore. Now, a couple of other quick gotchas and things to watch for when we're creating HTML forms. The first one is we need to make sure that all of our form contents are inside of the opening and closing form tag. Let me show you what happens without that. Let's say I create my form, but I forget to move this closing form tag down to the bottom. Watch what happens now. My page looks okay, but when I submit it, notice clicking submit nothing doesn't ha doesn't load our show email page anymore. The form is completely inactive because my submit button and the inputs are outside of our form tag. So it's critical our closing form tag goes below all of our form inputs. So that's it for our form. So what we need to do now is see how do we build our show email page so we can read the value that I entered in the text box and then we just want to print it out to the screen. So let's start building our show email page. So I'm going to create a new PHP file. I'm immediately going to save it as show email.php. Now again, the name is case sensitive. Notice there's no spaces in it and I've used a .php extension. I need a .php extension because we're going to need to write some PHP code in order to interpret the form input. We won't be able to read those form inputs with HTML alone. So I'm going to save my page. We'll just put in a generic title. It doesn't really matter what it says. And we just need a couple of lines of PHP code. Now, whenever we're writing PHP code, as we said last week, our code always has to be enclosed in PHP script tag. So I'm just going to open and immediately go down to the bottom and close our PHP script. I'm also going to add some comments to the file and I'll comment our files throughout the course just so that it helps explain what our code is doing. So the first thing we want to do is capture the form input and store it in a variable. Now this is an optional step. We don't have to do this, but you'll see from a coding perspective as well as from a typing perspective, it's a lot easier to work with our form inputs if we first transfer them into variables uh, because the variable names are just a lot easier to work with. So what I'm gonna do is create a variable and I'm gonna call it dollar sign email. In PHP, all variables are prefixed with a dollar sign. And we want to assign it a value. I'm gonna give my variable descriptive name. So where does the value come from? Well, our value is coming from our form that was posted to the server and we want to look at the input with the name of email all in lowercase. So the way we access this value is with PHP's built-in post collection called dollar sign underscore and here my code editor recognizes it and you'll notice the cursors flashing what we're being asked for is what is the name of the input on our form that we want to access. Well, that's called also in lowercase dollar sign email. And then we need to terminate our PHP command with a semicolon. So in effect, what this means in plain English is go to the form that was submitted using a post, find the input called email, take the value and store it in a variable also called email. It's good practice to create variables that match the form input names. As I said, this is an optional step. We don't really need a variable here, but if you notice for coding later on, this value with no dollar sign underscore brackets or quotes is going to be less typing and less prone to error. Then what we want to do is display a message that includes the email value entered by the user. So PHP has a simple command we're going to use a lot. Whenever we want to output content to the screen, 
the PHP function we use for that is called echo. So here's how we can display our value. We can say your email address is. And now we have two ways of referencing the value. We could use this whole syntax, dollar sign underscore post email, or we could just use our shortcut variable we created called dollar sign email. So I'll print that out. We'll save our file. And now we need to upload it to the server, reload our page, try it again and see what happens. So when I go back to FileZilla, notice my show email file doesn't show up in my local file system online. It's here. So when we add a new page, I just need to right click and refresh. Now my show email page is here. So if I upload this to the server, now all I can do, what I can do is simply if I hit refresh, my browser will ask me if I want to resend the form data. So if I click on resend, it shows me the email variable that comes from our email address. So if I go back and I want to change the email I enter in my form and click submit, whatever I enter in that form is now properly being interpreted on my show page. So far, so good. Now, a couple things we need to be careful of. I wanna stress again how important it is we know the case sensitivity and that whatever we call our form control here is how we have to reference it on our next page. So let's say here, I'm gonna change mine. You don't need to do this, but I'm gonna change this on this page, on my save page where I've capitalized the E in email. Now notice my form is still all lowercase. So let's look at what happens when I save my change and upload my code this way. So now I'll refresh and try to resend my form data, but this time my email address shows as blank if I do it again. So PHP considers, doesn't give us an error, but it considers that a form input called lowercase e email is not the same as one with a capital E. So I definitely want to make sure I put that back. So for consistency, I've used lowercase on my form, lowercase when I'm referencing it using the post collection, and a lowercase variable with the same name. Now one of the other common questions is, well, why did we use double quotes around this? Couldn't we use single quotes? Well, we can. Let's try it and see what happens. So if I run the same command, but this time, the same echo command, but this time I'll use single quotes around it. Let's try it out and see what happens. I'll go back to my form. I'll resubmit. So here's our first statement. It shows the email address, but look what happens when I try to add my variable inside of single quotes. When I, you'll notice that my email variable is parsed and interpreted correctly inside the double quotes, but when I embed it inside a statement with single quotes, the PHP interpreter reads dollar sign email as a literal rather than a variable. So we've learned one of the important distinctions between single and double quotes in PHP. When we're printing with double quotes or using double quotes, we can embed a PHP variable and the PHP interpreter knows that's a variable and gives us the value. In single quotes, however, it's treated as a literal. So what do we do? What we're gonna need to do is reference this variable from outside of our single quotes. So what we'll do, I'm gonna move my closing single quote over here, and now what we need to do is concatenate or append the literal string together with our variable. PHP is a very strange operator for this. In most languages, uh, like in Java, we, use, we would tend to use a plus sign. Some other languages might use an ampersand. In PHP, the concatenate operator is actually a dot doesn't make sense to me. I like to think of a dot as separating things rather than joining them together, but they didn't ask me when they created the PHP language. So I'm going to save my file. 
I'll re-upload it and resend my data. Now you notice when we've concatenated the variable outside of the single quote, the PHP interpreter is able to properly read that value. So line 19 and line 16, these are functionally equivalent. Now, I would argue, and you'd probably, most people would probably agree, that the version in line 16 with double quotes is easier, and I would agree it is. So the natural question is, well, why would we ever use single quotes? Good question. We do often use single quotes in our PHP echo commands when we want to include not only PHP variables, but when we also want to include HTML tags for formatting, because you'll notice our HTML tags include double quotes. So that's a little gotcha. Um, we'll come back to this and you'll see this more. So here's our completed page. We don't need to make any other changes to this. Um, but what I want you to do is, if you're having trouble, then pause the video, rewind and walk through. And I want you to make sure before you move on to the next activity and mark this one as reviewed, make sure that you're getting this result that you see in my browser. Your form shows up and whatever you enter in the form submission should show up in both the sing double quote and single quote version.